to get the first proof of concept prototype, it shouldn't take you more than a few months. I would say three to six months. And if you are taking longer than that, that means you are not showing your product early enough to your customers. Will the business owners pay for it? It doesn't matter how much you charge. You can charge like a dollar per call, two dollars per call. The fact that they're willing to pay and they're willing to pay month after month after month is the best testimonial for your product. Hi, I'm so excited to be here. I'm Aaron Lee, co-founder and CEO of Smith AI. Smith AI is a startup that helps small medium businesses to handle their inbound and outbound communications 24 seven. We handle your phone calls, live chat, SMS, and Facebook messengers. So I joined the Google early 2004. I was one of the first two engineers to build Google videos. Also by that time, YouTube came along, so we were kind of competing. But by the end of 2006, it was clear that YouTube was like taking the internet by storm and the rest was history. So after that, I joined the YouTube team and worked on their monetization. So I work on AdWords for like video, Essence for video. And eventually I spent about almost like five years at Google. Google is a very engineering centric company. I mean, back in the days, like when Larry and Sergey and Eric were still kind of the trio running the company, the mantra is let the engineers to explore, give them the flexibility and the freedom. I think both Larry and Sergey are also engineers by training, but they're not business focused. If you probably remember when they pitched to Kleiner Perkins or like Sequoia, they did not have the business model. They said like, let me show you some of the really cool technologies, right? So I was engineer by training, but at the same time, I was also fascinated by the problem products, their user experience, and some of the business model. If you're building a product for like B2B or B2C, you really want to talk to a ton of customers. And even after you build the product or the prototype, you want to talk to them even more because once you put the product in their hands, you will find out a whole new set of problems and the things that they're interested in, and they will never be the problems that you anticipated that they will have. So that part is like very interesting to me. So I kind of like start moving further and further away from engineering to building product. So I said, well, it's time for me to, you know, start my first company. So I left Google in 2008, the other two ex-Googlers, right in the month of the financial crisis. And all the VCs were like, no money for you guys. And we said, great, that means we can like keep our heads down, build a product. So by the time we launched our first product, it was a company called Red Beacon. It's a marketplace to connect the homeowners with the home improvement professionals. And we took the top prize in TechCrunch. And because the year prior, there were no funding for the other startups, so we had no competitors. So we went nationwide very quickly. Back then, finding a reliable professional was really, really difficult. You may go to Yelp or Yellow Pages or Angie's List. It's just really unreliable. You don't know will they be able to do it at the price that you can budget for and what time can they come. We believe like we could actually build a much more efficient marketplace where people can go in, they can submit the job request, they just say, okay, within 10, 15 minutes, people say, yep, I can do your job. This is my price range and I can come by next week. So we want to make the connection between people having a job like homeowners to the professionals who are looking for projects or jobs much more efficiently. And that's not much different than like LinkedIn, right? When they first build up, like they are basically matching opportunities with the job seekers. I think the most challenging part of building Red Beacon is when we have the demand and we don't have the supply, you have to quickly find the supply or the customer will be disappointed. It's almost a race, right? How quickly can you find the most reliable, amazing providers that can meet the need? In the early days, how do we source this kind of like supply side? We source many of the review side. If you think about it, it's almost like a human scraper, right? You go into to Yelp or Angie's List and you look at these profiles and you say, which pros are getting the most consistent positive feedback? And then you just call them up and say, hey, I have a customer that is waiting for you. Would you be interested in signing up? By the way, I can send you the job right now. If you can tell me your email, your phone number, we start building the profile for you. So once you build up that database, then you can do the matching a lot faster and a lot more efficiently. Now, here's the challenge. If you don't have enough supply, then the customer will be disappointed because they said, I submitted the job, I've been waiting for more than a day now, and there's no one interested. This platform is not useful. 
Now, if you have too much supply, then the business will say, I don't get enough jobs from your platform. Eventually, we figure out one of the magic number is if you can send about four to five jobs, kind of one per week, you can keep the companies or the providers or home improvement professionals engaged. Once they get engaged, they will be excited about your platform. That means whenever someone put a job in, they will respond quickly. Home Depot actually knocked on our door and they said, wow, I mean, this is something that they've been thinking about it for a long time. After the acquisition, I actually stayed on as the CTO for another three years. It was really a perfect match when Home Depot approached us because they want to build a connection between their customers. So they have two sides of the marketplace, the homeowners and the home professionals. So Home Depot thought it would be amazing to basically say, if you go to Home Depot, buy something, could be a kitchen cabinet or a carpet or something that you want to install and you can find someone that can do it for you. But they also want some kind of trust they have the brand, like they've been here for almost like four decades. So when people talk about, oh, this is coming from Home Depot, they have the trust, they have the brand. They're not like Red Beacon, oh, I never heard about Red Beacon. So that is the problem of like, when you build up the marketplace, you need to get to the critical mass. In order to get to the critical mass, you need the brand and the trust. So that is something that I would say, not even money can buy. You cannot buy the brand, you cannot buy the trust, you cannot buy the distribution. You probably can, unless you spend a lot of money. over the past three years at Home Depot and throughout my career, you keep hearing people say, look, I cannot respond to your lead. I am driving on the road. I am working on this roof. I'm working in the attic. If you think about the transition from Red Beacon to Smith AI, it's very similar, right? I mean, when we send them the leads, we say, hey, I have a job for you. And they will say, oh, I'm just so busy. When we call them, they don't pick up the phone. When we send them an email or text message, they don't reply right away. And that problem is so fundamental to pretty much all the SMB today because they just don't have the time and they don't have the team and they don't even have the IT experts to build a system to do it. So we start building our team are using both AI and the human like agents as the fallback. And the goal is to make sure that we can handle every single call that are coming in within a few rings. We're not just about taking a message. We want to qualify the lead. We want to make sure that our agent can handle the business and represent the business. I call the ICP, the Ideal Customer Profile for Smith AI. They are the people that time is money. Every single minute can. High opportunity cost. If you miss a call, let's say you're a real estate agent or you're the property managers, if you miss a call or chat, the cost of missing that is very high. The last one is I call the high LTV, lifetime value. So think about dentists. Now you go to do a dental cleaning or cleaning your teeth, it may seem like, oh, it's only like two or $300. But if once you find a good dentist, you're going to stay with the dentist for many years. So the lifetime value of that patient could be like tens of thousands of dollars and even more for the orthodontist. So if you think about that, like people who have high LTV, high opportunity cost, time is money would be our ideal customer profile. So that means lawyers, home service professionals, like real estate agents, general contractors, interior designers. We serve a very, very long tail of like customers. In the early days of Smith AI, we spent a lot more time talking to our customers first. We spent a few months talking to the customers. And while we're talking to our customers, it's actually a good way to acquire your first customers because you know the pain points, you know that like they're looking for the solution, what we're offering. By the time you build the product, you can go back to them and say, I have the product that you asked a few months ago. It doesn't mean that they will say, great, I'm gonna pay for it. And then they will say, wait a minute, like I really want this, but you guys don't have that. Can you come back to me when you have it? But if you look at like from the moment that we know what we need to build to the moment that we launch, I would say three to six months, right? I mean, of course, like we have a lot of bugs to fix. We have a lot of things like to improve, but to get, I would say the first proof of concept prototype, it shouldn't take you more than a few months. And if you are taking longer than that, that means you are not showing your product early enough to your customers. So I think one thing that a lot of the founders embarrassed or maybe a, a little bit shy is they don't want to talk about their ideas. They, oh, my idea is not fully baked. I'm re not ready to tell the world. I think the problem is by the time you want to show your product, it's probably too late. You should have gotten the feedback and advice. So we basically early on, we tell people, hey, we're building this. Would you like to try? And by the way, it's not going to be perfect and I'm probably going to be very embarrassed 
because the product may or may not work but I would love to get your feedback. So having a thick skin, not feeling embarrassed is the key. From there, you start learning and learning and start iterating your products. One thing it's very important to know whether you have the right product market fit is will the business owners pay for it? It doesn't matter how much you charge. You can charge like a dollar per call, two dollars per call. The fact that they're willing to pay and they're willing to pay month after month after month is the best testimonial for your product. And by the way, one of the most important thing about the SMB is they are very budget sensitive. Meaning, if they don't find something of value, even maybe like 20 or $30, they will cancel it right away. They are not gonna wait. Now, versus if you think about a bigger company, more like cash on the balance sheet, they may say, oh, like a small man, they probably don't care. Like, it's okay that your product is not like full featured, but it's important that people are paying for your MVP. So in fact, we are generating revenue since day one. We're not the type of the companies that you have the freemium model, meaning like paying a lot of like 98% free users and 2% of pay users. Every user who use our product on Smith AI, they're paying for it. So to be honest, we didn't know what was the right pricing strategy. So we start, we pick a number. I think in the beginning, we were charging people like $2 per call. And we know that like we were not perfect. We knew that. Then at some point people would say, okay, wow, this is really good values. When you hear people say, this is so cheap, then you know you're a little bit underpriced. Now, at some point you're charging something a little bit higher and people will say, wait a minute, like I don't understand why you guys are charging me this. Like this would be very little and very cheap. So we adjust our pricing. So every year we change our pricing based on the values that we deliver. Our goal is if we can absorb some of the cost, we can get more customers, then at the end, like it's a win-win. There are more people who are using our platform, they are paying at a lower rate. So I would say, uh, don't get too hung up on coming up with the perfect pricing in the beginning. Your pricing should be proportional to the values that you deliver to the business. It's okay to change your pricing. That's definitely fine.